before we start, let's uh, start with a prayer so we can stand up for a quick prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for this day that you have given to us. Thank you for another chance that we can get back together and get a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Really pray, dear amen. Heavenly Father, that you're in our presence and you're in our midst and that each one of us would hear like a message from you today and that you would guide us to where it is you want us to go. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, so we can see the message that you have for us. Pray all this name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the intercessions and prayers of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, have a seat. <clears throat> Okay, those of you looking for seats, there's plenty of seats up in uh, this section area. Well, it's nice to see so many new faces uh, that's here with us today. You have to forgive me if I can't see all your faces. I'm a little bit blinded by the light here, but uh, I can see lots of different faces out there, so that's good. We welcome you all very much. We're starting today a uh, new series that is named after, I believe there's a popular show out there called Deal or No Deal. Maybe some of you have heard of it before. If you haven't heard about it, we'll give you a quick little uh, run through right now. The whole point of the show, okay, <clears throat> it's a game show. It's one of these like win a million dollar kind of a game shows. And the whole point of the game, for those of you who haven't seen it, is there's a case, a suitcase, a special suitcase that has like a million dollars in it. And your job is to kind of go through and eliminate different suitcases to try to get to the one million dollars. So we are going to do our own version of Deal or No Deal, but I'm not going to give away a million dollars, but what I am going to give away is going to be even better. For those of you who know the show, like I said, the whole point of the show is to try to find the case with the one million dollars. Well, we're going to be doing kind of a similar thing here in this series, but what we're looking for, as they did that nice little skit here for us, is not a million dollars, but we're looking for something much, much more valuable than even that. The funnest part about the show, I've only seen one episode, a half of an episode, but the funny part of the show is watching people like squirm when they're not sure like what to do. Because everyone wants to get a million dollars. But some people, like there's two kinds of people that you see. Either the people who are, you know, going to go for and, and risk whatever they have, even if they lose all their money and just end up with a dollar. Or there's other people who tend to play it safe. The worst part about it is when you see the guy playing it safe and he ends up having like the million dollars in, in his pocket or something like that. So we're going to play the same game, but hopefully we're going to avoid some of their mistakes. And we're going to change the rules slightly. The first thing we got to determine is what is the lucky case that we're looking for? What's the, what's the goal of our little competition here? What is it that we're trying to find? What we're trying to find, as they so nicely put here for us, our goal is to find the original New Testament church. And what I mean by that is throughout this series, what we're going to be trying to do here together is we're going to try to go back, try to go back in time a little bit right here. Because what you see out there is that there's many people who do church in different ways. And we're not here to condemn anyone's different ways of doing church or we're not here judging anyone or anything like that. But what we are trying to do is to do a little bit like a, you know, comparison shopping. Okay? We want to open up. This is where the rule is going to be different than the game show. We're going to open up all the different suitcases from the beginning. And we're going to let you look at all of them and see what's inside every one of them. And then you get to choose whichever one you want. Our goal is going to be to open up the different churches that are out there and try to see which one of them contains the original New Testament church. What I'm saying by that is, is that 2,000 years ago, there was a man 
whose name was Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, who walked around on this earth, who had apostles and had disciples. He died, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And his disciples had a church. All right, and it's written about in the book of Acts. They had a church, and they did the whole church thing. And what we want to see is which of the churches that's out there most closely like resembles that church or even better is that same church now with that said let me start off and i'll say this at the beginning of every session i'm not saying that i'm not judging anyone or anything like that and i'm not saying that all churches are wrong except us that's what probably you think i'm going to be saying that i'm going to say that we're right and everyone else is wrong no that's not what i'm going to say and that's why i kind of like the model of this game because in the game, the goal is to get a million dollars. But some people end up with 100,000. Some people end up with 500,000. Some people end up with 750,000. The point is, is there's value in every single one of the suitcases, but some of them have more value than others. Agree? Well, it's the same thing in the churches. I'm not going to sit here and condemn all the other churches simply because I don't know enough, and it's only God's job is to judge. The point is, is that you can walk away from other churches with value, but what we want to see is, where's the million dollars? Where's the jackpot? Where's the original New Testament church? Where's the church that most closely resembles what our Lord Jesus Christ envisioned when he began the church many, many years ago? Like I said, all the suitcases have value, but only one of them has got a jackpot, and our goal is going to be to find that jackpot. So, where are we going to look? <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> we're going to look everywhere. And we're going to look around at all the different churches that are out there, okay? Not in detail as much as like general, you know, groupings of churches. And what we're going to try to do is see, like I said, which one is the church that Christ started. Christ didn't start 500 churches, okay? He didn't start a thousand different denominations. He started one church. So there should be one right answer to this question. The difference between our series and the game show is I'm going to tell you the answer up front. And the answer is very simply, <clears throat> the Orthodox Church is the original Christian church established by our Lord Jesus Christ upon the foundation of the apostles. That's the answer. That's the jackpot. That's what we're looking for. Now, what we're going to try to do over the next several weeks is to understand what that means We'll do that today. And then over the next several weeks is to understand which suitcase that is in now. To understand which suitcase we have to open in order to find this prize. But like I said, there has to be an answer. Because Christ started only one church. There's only one suitcase that can have the million dollars. I know that that's like sometimes like is like offensive and this and that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that only Orthodox people is going to heaven. Okay, so don't put words in my mouth and try to trip me up. That's not what I'm saying. Again, I'm not in a position to say it. Even if I believe it or don't believe it, I'm not in a position to determine who goes to heaven and who doesn't go. What I'm saying is that our Lord Jesus Christ started one church, right? And he spoke about that in John chapter 10, verse 16. He said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay? So Christ's vision for the church was there would be, his idea of the church, there would be one flock and one shepherd, not many, many, many. So what we're going to do right now for this next several weeks is try to dig inside, try to go back in time a little bit and see what the original church looked like. Anytime we talk about the powerful church and the spirit-filled church, we always think back to like Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 and the book of Acts kind of a church. Well, in theory, we should be able to go back in time, see what that church was like, and see where that, if that church exists today or not. That's the goal of this series in a nutshell. The series is based on some assumptions. The first assumption and the most important one is that not every church is the church. That's an important one to understand. You see the distinction between church with a little c and church with a capital C. There, there are many churches, but only one church. What I mean by that is, again, Christ didn't start 25 churches. He didn't say, okay, you guys, you're going to be this denomination, you guys are going to be this, you guys are going to be this, and all of you do different stuff. He didn't start that. He started one church, capital C. 
And just because other places call themselves churches doesn't mean it's necessarily the church. There's a church of Satan out there. They're called church. They get tax exempt status. They have a little pastor's thing in their window or whatever. They can park in their pastor, clergy parking or whatever. Does that make them a church because they call themselves a church? No. Not every church is the church. And just because someone claims to be a church doesn't give them the validity of the church. There's the, I mean, if we're talking about the church of Christ, there's the whole Latter-day Saints kind of people who pretty much call themselves that. So there's all kinds of people who use the word church, but I'm talking about the church. And when I say the church, I'm going back 2,000 years to an organization, not organization, uh, a set of believers, okay, an institution that was established by our Lord Jesus Christ with his apostles and his disciples. Founded in where? In Jerusalem about the year 33 A.D. That's the New Testament church. St. Paul speaks about this church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's what I'm looking for. This is right here what I'm looking for. Where's the group of people that has been, is been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone? Where's the building? There's many buildings with many different kinds of foundation. Where's the one with the foundation? Is our Lord Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, and then the apostles are the foundation on top of that. That's what we're looking for. <clears throat> and again... I already told you the answer, okay? But well, I, you don't have to take, like, I don't want you to take my word for it, okay? Yeah, I work for the Orthodox Church, so I have to say that or else I get fired. That's not, I want you to think about it, and I want to discuss it with you, and I want you to be logical and reasonable. But, like I said, I already told you the answer in advance, so it's up to you whether you believe me or not believe me. But the Orthodox Church has this, okay? When I look, <clears throat> let's say me, for example, I'm an ordained priest in the Orthodox Church, where my, or who ordained me? Where my ordination comes from? Like, I do liturgy. I do communion. I do confession. I do stuff like that. Who, where, where's it coming from? Well, I was ordained at the hands of Pope Shenouda III, the 117th Patriarch of the Coptic Church, who was ordained by Pope Carolus before him, who was ordained by Pope Eusebe before him, who was ordained by so-and-so, by so-and-so, by so-and-so, by so-and-so. And you know what? If you trace the lineage back, you'll see that it goes back to when St. Mark went to Egypt and ordained, started ordaining people and built a church right there. And who ordained St. Mark? Christ. You see, the Orthodox Church can say this that the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself is the chief cornerstone because my ordination came from Christ through the hands of St. Mark to St. Ananias to St. So-and-so to Pope So-and-so to Bishop What's-His-Name to Pope Him and this and that and it's a lineage that comes all the way down through. Ain't no guy named Joe Smith anywhere in the lineage or Ed Brown or anything like that, okay? Our priesthood in the Orthodox Church goes back and it's a direct chain that links back to Jerusalem, the year 33 AD. And that's the, the, the connection. That's what's called the apostolic succession. But like I said, our goal for the series is to uncover that. What's going to help is if we kind of look at like a timeline of events. <clears throat> We're going to look at like a timeline of church history. Now usually in America, church history is like three, four hundred years old. But church history goes back to way, way, way back before then. Like I said in the beginning, church history started in the year 33 AD. Christ rose from the dead, ascended to the heavens. Pentecost, we can say Pentecost is like the official, like groundbreaking for the church. That's when the church like officially opened its doors, when they baptized so many people in St. Peter preached and 2,000 people was baptized and joined. So that's the very, very beginning of it all. <clears throat> At the beginning, like I said, there was only one church. There wasn't like, okay, that St. Peter was in charge of the Catholic Church and then St. James was in charge of the Baptist Church and this guy's in charge of the Lutheran Church. It was one church. But eventually, the church started to grow and grow and grow and it started to move around to different places. So people started to travel all over the world. So what happened is, is you had one church 
okay? You had one church, but different like hubs. So there was like a hub. The main hub was like Jerusalem. That was like headquarters. But then you had another hub of people that was gathered in Alexandria and Egypt. You had another hub of people in Rome. You had another hub of people in like Antioch. So they were called the churches of these different places, but they were still one church, okay? Like the book of Revelation says to the church of Philadelphia, the church of uh, Theatira. It's still one church, but it's just the city that it's located in, okay? Just like as today, there's many Coptic churches, but there's the church of Washington, the church of Philadelphia, the church of wherever. So it was one church with many locations. And during this time period between here, this was like the golden area, the golden era, okay? And during this time, up until 451, I'll get to 451 in a second, but between 33 and 451, one church, all unified. I'm from the Alexandria church. I go on vacation with my wife to Rome. No problem. Take communion, attend. No problem. We're all one church. Maybe speak different languages, but we're all one church. No problem whatsoever. Existed in the church at this time. They had what's called ecumenical councils, where they called all the peoples together from different places, discussed stuff. 451 comes up. 451 is when stuff happens, okay? And it's unfortunate that stuff happened. But what you happened in 451, there was a council of Chalcedon where there was a split in the church. I'm not going to get into why because it's a very, very long discussion. It's kind of like a he said, she said kind of a thing. We say that they was wrong. We excommunicated them. They say, no, you was wrong, so we excommunicated you. And each one said this. I said this about your pope. You said this about my pope. There's all kinds of funny stuff going on in there. The end result of it is the church got split into two factions. Those who accepted the teachings of the Council of Chalcedon, called the Chalcedonian Orthodox, also called Eastern Orthodox, and then the other group of non-Chalcedonian. Non-Chalcedonian is also called Oriental. But I don't like Oriental and Eastern, because what does Oriental mean? Doesn't it mean Eastern? That's why I don't like that term. So I don't use Oriental, because Orient to me means East. So I call them Chalcedonian, and it's more descriptive, and non-Chalcedonian. The point of this is, is they got together for a council, and each one went separate ways. Some people was on the top side. That's where you have, like, your Greek Orthodox, your Russian Orthodox, your big dog Orthodox churches. And then here, in the non-Chalcedonian, you have more of the humble, the smaller Orthodox churches, okay? <laughs> By the way, the Coptic happens to be in that bottom one right there, and the Indian church, and the Syrian church, and things like that. But here's the thing that I want you to see, because I took great care in creating this timeline. That even though there's a split right here, what you will see is the church is still moving in the same direction. They're just not moving in the same direction together. But they are moving in the same direction, and both are moving the straight line. Because the faith did not change. Okay? It was not a, uh, a dogmatic split. Okay? Even though they may have thought so at the time, that it's not a dogmatic split. The faith is the same. They were just saying the same things in different ways, and tempers flared and all that kind of stuff. The point is, is that the faith remain the same. That's important. After this point in time in 451, the bottom part of the timeline, the Coptic church stays unaffected. It is the same then as it was today, like there's been no change, and no activities happen. It's the top half where all the fun stuff happened. Next part, we get to 1054, is where the Roman Catholic church broke off. Now you see here, it's not a straight line. It's moving in a different direction. And what you see is that it's no longer the same faith. They're moving away from the original faith. And this is not me bashing anyone else's, anything in that. It's, history says that in the year 1054, the Catholic Church decided to add certain teachings which had not been around for the first 1054 minus 33 years of Christianity. They added certain things. I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong. Okay? But what I'm saying is things were added to the faith at that point in time. After that... <clears throat> We get to like the 15 and 1600s, and that's where chaos breaks loose. That's where you have the Reformation and Martin Luther and, all, and the Anglican Church and all that kind of stuff. The point is here, what you'll see is, at this point in time, control was lost. Some went further away, some went closer back. Some went this direction, some went that direction, but the landscape became muddled at that point in time because now there was thousands and thousands and thousands of denominations that are going on. What I want you to see... <clears throat> with this church history right here, is the reason why I can say the Orthodox Church built on the foundation of the apostles and has that connection because the line is still the same in the straight place. If there was no 
let's say everyone was perfect, there was no devil in the world, and everyone got along with everyone, where would the church be today? The church should be where this X is. That's where it should be. That's what Christ's vision for the church was, to be right there. Okay? And like I said, it's unfortunate that it's not, but what you'll see is, is that the Orthodox churches are the only ones that can claim that they moved in the same straight line. <clears throat> That's a brief overview of, like, the history of it. Over the next several weeks, we'll, we'll break down some of the details of, of the different things. But for today, my hope is that we can just examine, even at, like, let's do this. Let's forget about titles of different churches. Let's examine at a theoretical level what the church should be. Okay? You're God. You're creating the church. You're starting a church. What it should be in theory, even if it's not there in practice. For those of you who are with us on New Year's Eve, you know, every year we set like a theme for the church. Our theme for this year in the church is to discover exactly this. Our theme for the, this year in the church is to discover what the true church should be and to try to make ourselves look like that church. And we agreed that the church is more than a meeting and the church is more than a sermon and the church is more than like attending on Sundays. We said the church is something much, much greater than that. If I had to come up with a kind of a definition right here, I would say that the church is the eternal and mystical body of Christ. Each word there is critical. Is the eternal and mystical body of Christ. Meaning the church is not a club. The church is not a Dunkin' Donut shop that will be open this week and closed next week. The church is not something which pops up and goes. The church is much more than that. First thing, it is eternal. It is something that will last for all eternity, and it's a forever kind of a thing. It is something which is mystical. Mystical meaning, not like psychic hotline and stuff like that. Mystical meaning there's a mystery. There's something there which you can't necessarily explain. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. That's something that is not a human organization. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, St. Paul says this. He says, He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head, him being Christ, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Think about that sentence for a second. The fullness of him who fills all in all. That's like I said in the beginning. Is that God has a fullness, has a bigness. In some places, I'm not judging or anything like that. But what I'm saying is some people are living with 10% of it. And some people are content. Hey, I got my case with the $100. Psh, very happy. Go buy a burger or whatever. I'm very happy. Still got some change left over after taxes. Some people's content. Some people's living with 20%. Some people's living with 30%. But the only way to get the fullness of him who fills all in all is to go back to the original design of, or to be that church, which is the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, where he is the head and I am the body. He is the head, meaning he's the one to determine what it should look like. Like That's like a critical thing again, a critical assumption here for this series is that when we, decide, when we say we're going to search, we're searching for what he wants, not for what I want. Most of us are out there, most people, are out, people who church shopping and stuff like that is shopping until they find something that matches what they want. Let's get rid of what we want. Let's just say that from the beginning that he's the head and that we want to find what he wants. His design for the church. He sets the rules of how we look. He sets the rules of where we go. He sets the rules of what we do when we get there. He sets all the rules for how our life in the body is supposed to look like. Not every man for himself. You do what you want in your church. I do what I want in my church. Everyone who doesn't like it, everyone just be whatever kind of church you want to be. God had a vision in mind when he started the church. And his vision was so much more than many different denominations and many different people, you know, scattered about and believe in different things and doing all kinds of different stuff. How do I know that he cared so much about this? If you look after Christ's resurrection, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, says just one verse 
that covers a long period of time. It says, He presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This verse says that for 40 days, Christ did not heal, he did not preach, he did not cure, he didn't do five loaves and do fish, he didn't walk on water, he didn't do nothing except one thing. He took his disciples, 12 guys, and said, we only got 40 days, and I got to teach you a lot of stuff. I got to teach you how the church is supposed to look like. And I got to teach you what you're supposed to— He had a vision and a plan, and he implanted it in them. So if you want to know where the original church is, it is implanted inside the disciples of the Lord. That's where it all is written down in there. Again, sometimes our idea of the church is the church should be what I want it to be. That's very dangerous. We live in America. Democracy, votes, all that kind of stuff. Church had nothing to do with democracy. And anyone who said church is democracy. And who says that isn't, isn't talking about this church, isn't talking about the body of Christ church. Church is very simple. Not a democracy. I'll use a big word here for you and see if you know what it means. A theocracy. Anyone know what that means? I just learned it myself. <laughs> Theocracy is like democracy, but it puts theo in the beginning. Theo means God. So democracy means ruled by the people. Theocracy means ruled by God. Okay? So it's very, very simple. The church, capital C church. The little c churches, yeah. Ed is in charge of that church. Uh, Bill's in charge of that church. Um, what's her name is in charge of that church. Yeah, that's fine. The little c church. But the church, no, no, no. Church is only one person in charge. He makes the rules. And he decides, like again, like, like we talk about on New Year's, talking about tithing and stuff like that. Well, I don't agree with tithing. It doesn't matter to me what you agree with. It, you're not in charge, okay? You make your own church that doesn't believe in tithing. That's fine with me, but you're not part of the church because the church says, the head of the church says, you tithe. I don't believe in this, um, you know, that uh, whatever. What does the church say? Fasting. I don't buy that fasting business. I believe this and that. That's fine. You don't buy what you don't want to buy. It d- doesn't matter to me. But the church, there's no, there's no discussion. Church is, is, is theocracy. God's in charge. He's the head. We're the body. You can't have, like, God painted, like, a nice picture here. Every time you look in the mirror, you see a head and a body. And that's what the church is supposed to be. Who makes the decisions around here? Okay? Not every man for himself, and the finger does what he wants, and the, my foot wants to go left, and my other one wants to go right. You have a, 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 a messed up situation going on. You have problems. If your head, ah, here's a good one. If my head tells my arm, move up, and it doesn't move up, my body is sick. Agree? If my head, if the control center says to my foot to do like this and it can't do it, then I, my, I have a problem. Something is wrong in this situation. Same thing in the body of Christ. <clears throat> what happens when you have a body without a head? <clears throat> you know the expression, chicken with his head cut off? i never seen it. Any, any farmers here seen a chicken with his head cut off? Anyone? <laughs> I don't know what it looks like, but the expression is that it runs around kind of crazy for a little bit and it kind of dies in the end. Well, I think that's a good analogy for what happens to the church when it loses its head. It doesn't die right away. It kind of runs around with its head cut off for a little bit and does different stuff and makes noise. And then eventually it kind of drops dead. <clears throat> so the church is the mystical body of Christ where Christ himself is the head. Next question. God's vision for the church. What I mean by vision is, like when he looked at it, what does he see? I know what it should be, but what does that mean in practice? What should it look like? I think that God's vision for the church is to be his family. Not a family, but his family. We already said he's the head and we're the body. He's the father, we're the kids. If you look at it, if there's one father, if God is the father of me and God is the father of you, that means that we should be in the same family. There can only be one family. I, as a father, can't have many families, okay? And if I do, there's some other issues going on right there, which is not correct, okay? But I, as a father, I have one wife, and I have one family. Now, the family could have 10 kids, could have 50 kids, could have as many kids as you want, but it's one family. That's the vision. God is the father, the church as the mother, 
and us as the kids. All of us kids together. Some kids may move away to college. Some kids may come back. Some kids may be in the army. Some kids may have failed out. Whatever it may be. We're still one family. With God as our father and the church as our mother. <clears throat> Every now and then the mother needs to slap you around a little bit, right? That's what the church should be doing as well. If the church is, is our mother, the church needs every now and then give us a whooping like that to kind of keep us disciplined and kind of keep us in line. And we can't rebel against our mother because she's our mother and she'll always be our mother. What I'm saying here is that our Lord Jesus Christ had a plan. Like that's one thing that I want you guys to take away from today's session is that there's a plan. There's a plan. It's not haphazard. It's not like, you know what, it'd be nice if there's a church. Yeah, you know, whatever. Do it how you want. It doesn't matter. No, there's a plan, a clear plan. And he has a vision. And how it's supposed to look. And our Lord Jesus Christ invested a lot, a lot, to make his plan happen. He was very careful about the little itsy-bitsy, even little details to make sure that his plan was realized. If you look at why did Christ come to earth? Standard answer, we say, Christ came to die for us. It's wrong. It's not that it's wrong, but it's incomplete. He didn't come to just die for us, because if he came to just die for us, he would have just died for us, and that would have been it. And if, if that was it, he'd have just died and gone up and, and not bothered doing the rest of the stuff that he did. He came, and he didn't leave until one thing happened. What was the fulfillment, the completion of our Lord's mission? The church. He didn't just die and leave. He died. He rose. He taught them about the church. And he told them what he wanted. Then he left. And as soon as he left, the church started up immediately. So what I want you to see is, is that his entire plan from the beginning of all time, as soon as Adam, as soon as Adam took that bite, forget about even Adam, as soon as Eve took the thing off the tree, God had a plan, a specific plan, a clear vision. And that vision came to realization after his ascension and the Holy Spirit came down when the beginning of the church. <clears throat> look what he says here. If you want to see how much Christ thought about the church, look what he says. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. He says, Also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. My is key there. Not build a church. I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Hear what he's saying there? He's saying, this is my baby. Don't you be scared of nothing. It's my baby. Let, let all the power of Hades come against it. It can't touch my church. Then he goes on. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in he heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What I like there is what it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. All of us want to get to heaven. If I want to go from my house to someplace else and I have the nicest car in the whole wide world, if I'm missing one thing, it isn't going to do me any good, which is the keys. Where's the key to heaven? Where is it? This church is teaching this. This church is teaching that. This book and this and this and that. Where's the key? The key is not in a book. The key is in the church. <clears throat> what I'm going to say next is going to really disturb some people. The key is not even, the key is not the Bible. Look, if the key was the Bible, if the Bible was the most important thing, and I'm not discrediting the Bible in any way, but what I'm saying is, if the Bible was the end-all be-all, why wouldn't he just written it and left? He didn't write anything. The Bible did not exist when the church started. It didn't exist, right? Church started in 33. Earliest epistle, earliest, 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 is like the late 40s. So there is a good, like, 33 to 40, let's say 30. That's, that's 12 years. 12 years? With no Bible. No, no, and that's just one epistle. The Bible wasn't put together. The last book of the Bible was St. John's Revelation. It wasn't written until like 95-something. There was no church until then. That didn't make any sense. I'm not saying that the Bible, of course the Bible is the Word of God and we need it. And it's our, it's our, it's our communication with God. But what I'm saying is, the key to the kingdom of heaven, not by my words, but by our Lord Jesus Christ's words, is the church. Because the church has everything in it. And the church 
He wrote stuff on the hearts of the disciples that wasn't written down on paper. He wrote stuff on the hearts of the apostles that wasn't written down with pen and paper. <clears throat> and like I said, we'll, we'll dissect all that. I'm just giving you kind of an overview today. We'll dissect that as we go along. What we're going to try to do next couple weeks is discover what this church looked like and then see if there's anything around us that looks very similar. We're going to get some help from a man named Father Peter Gilquist. Some of you have heard of him. Some of you have read his book. He wrote a book called Becoming Orthodox. It's a very, very good book, and I recommend it to anyone who is interested in learning more about this subject. Father Peter Gilchrist, for those of you who don't know, was, he's a convert to orthodoxy. He's someone who um, is like one of the, the guys when he was younger that was like Campus Crusade for Christ and like one of the leaders of that. And like, I think he had a very, very like instrumental role in the organization of that. Eventually, he became like a pastor of a church and he had his other buddies from Campus Crusade and stuff like that. And they were also pastoring churches. And they one day decided to play deal or no deal, just like us. And he said, you know what? You teach this, and I teach this. What's like, like, let's forget about everything that we've been taught. What's the truth? What's like the, the, the ancient? What's like the original? And they said that they were going to set out on a journey. And he details the journey in this book. And their goal was, like I said, to discover the New Testament church. And what they did was, is they broke it down. They got together with like seven or eight of them, and they, they like divided it up. Okay, so you're going to study the writings. You're going to study the theology. You're going to study like how they worshiped. You're going to study like how they interacted with each other. You're going to study this. And they all went out and did all their kinds of study. And they got back together, and they wanted to compare their notes on what the original church looked like. One of the guys, Jack Sparks, who was a member of this committee, who's now an Orthodox priest, said, there's a quote from the book, he said, everybody claims to be the New Testament church. The Catholics say they are, the Baptists say they are, the Church of Christ says it is, and nobody else is. We need to find out who's right. I like the way he said it. We need to find out who's right. Because again, there can only be one answer. There can't be many answers because Christ established one church. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that, yes, the Coptic Orthodox Church is perfect and this and that, and every other church is bad, bad, bad. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's one right answer, and what our goal is going to be together is to discover what that one right answer is. He came to a conclusion, which all came to its summit on February 15, 1987. February 15, 1987 was a momentous day in the history of the Orthodox Church, especially in America. On that one day... 200 people were baptized, okay, including Father Peter Gilchrist, all his committee, as well as all of their churches. In addition, 60 of them were ordained as clergy. It wasn't the end of the story. That was just one day. Over the rest of 1987, more than 2,000 evangelicals joined the Orthodox Church, the Antiochian Orthodox Church. Why? Why, why 2,000 people joined the church this year? Why 200 people was baptized in the morning? Do you know how much 200 people is? We do one baptism, it takes like a 30, 40 minutes, something like that. Do you know how many 200 is? 200 is a lot, okay? That's like all the number of people in here being baptized plus extra on top of that. That's like twice this number right here. That's a lot of people being baptized in a single day. Why? Simple. They found the lucky case. They found the million dollars. They hit the jackpot. They opened up the case and saw that it had the million dollars. Very simple. What they were able to do, and like I said, if you want more details, you can read the book, is they connected the dots. See, most people in our society and culture, church history to them, there's like two pieces of it. There's like, like the biblical time, like the New Testament time from like 33 to like 95. And then there's like Martin Luther till today. And there's nothing in between. And I know people who have told me. I have friends who are in other churches. And they told me when we had some discussions and stuff like that about church history and they were reading and stuff like that. Some people were taught. There's a teaching out there. St. John, the beloved, who was the last of the disciples, breathed his last breath in, 19, in, in the year 95 AD. And as soon as he did, the church fell apart. And it wasn't until the year 1500 something that it came back to life. That's what sometimes we're led to believe. But that simply isn't true. We need to connect the dots. And the only place that connects the, what connects the dots is the Orthodox Church. 
Like I said, it connected all the dots all the way from back from Christ until today. And like I said, we will see that in detail over the next several weeks. But for today, two things I want you to walk away with today. First thing is that God wants you to be part of his eternal family. God wants you to be part of his eternal family. God doesn't want you to be part of a church. That's not what I said. He does not want you to be part of a church. He wants you to be part of his eternal family, which will last the end of all ages. To preach, for me, to speak about Christ and a relationship with Christ without having the church is like for me to take a baby, have them be born in this world, and then send them out and hope that they do the best. And leave them on someone else's doorstep and hope that it makes it. It can't happen. One is incomplete without the other. Can't have a head without a body and a body without a head. The church, I'm sorry, Christ without the church is exactly like a child without parents. It isn't going to last very long. God wants you to be part of his eternal family. And if you are not connected to his eternal family, God wants to fix that. Because you're only going to go so far on your own. And you're limiting your own like spiritual growth. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 18 and 19. If you want to know what God thinks about, like, I said the church started in 33 AD, but in, in God's mind, the church was something from much, much before then. Because from the, from the very beginning of time, God had like a special plan for his people, a people that he would gather to himself. Who he speaks about him here. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise, in name, and in honor that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God just as he has spoken. From the very, very beginning, God's plan was that this was not said to a person. This was said to a people. From the very beginning, it was God's plan to have a people to himself. He tried with Adam and Eve. He said, you guys are like me. No separation. We walk together. We hang out together. Just don't touch that tree. They touched the tree. They blew it. God said, you know what? They blew it. I still want to have a people. He started to work with the Abrahams, the Isaacs, the Jacobs, the Joseph. Started to work with the prophets. Every time people would do good, they betrayed him. They went against him. And they didn't want to have anything to do with him. He said, you know what? Even though they're an unfaithful wife, even though they're a ungrateful people, I still want to have this people as my own. Sent his only begotten son into the world that he would make himself a people. And our Lord Jesus Christ labored hard day and night for 33 years to create this people to himself as a special people. And like I said, that's fulfilled in the church itself. Second thing I want you to remember is that the fullness of God's family, just as I was saying right there, God wants you all to be part of his family, but the fullness of that family is found only in the church. Like I said, some people is happy walking out with a case with 50 bucks. But it's really, really sad. It's really, really sad when the guy has the case with the one million and the banker offers him 100 bucks. Say, man, don't take it, idiot. Imagine you could see inside there. You'd be like, man, you got a million in there. It's right in front of you. And the guy walks out with $100. That's sad. Unfortunately, that's oftentimes what we do. The good news for us is there's no secrets. I'm going to open up all the cases. We're going to open up all the cases together. There's no secrets. Yeah, the guy in the show, he's guessing his now, he's playing his odds. There's no secrets here. We're going to open up every one of the cases, and we're going to see what's inside every one of them. And you're going to get a chance to see for yourself. And you will find out this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. This is the fulfillment, like I said, of when Christ came to make his special people to himself. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Again, this is not speaking to a person. The word person is not seen anywhere here. It's talking about a people. And what it says right here is that God looked down. It's kind of like me right now with you guys. I look down there, so much light in my face, I just see darkness. Okay? And God looked down and saw darkness. And he said, you know what? That's not right. 
I don't want darkness. I want a family. And he went down. He tried to send people. People didn't listen. So he went down himself. And he made for himself special people. A congregation. Uh, a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. And even, he says, who were once not even a people. Like, you weren't even a people before he came down. You weren't even a, a person before he came down, is what it's saying right here. But he's made us into a royal kind of people. As we say in the liturgy, that we who sat in the shadow of death, we were sitting in the shadow of death, and he came down and called us into his marvelous light. We've been given great honor here in the church. We've been given a great gift right here. And it's a shame that we don't realize the fullness of it. But I hope that you'll join me over the next several weeks as we uncover what the greatness is inside this church here. And I'll leave you with just one last quote right here. It's not in your handout. It's from a man named Father Theodore... Help me out here. Stylinopolopoulos. Okay. <laughs> what was the name of the guy from Full House? It was similar to that, right? Jesse Katsopoulos, something like that. <laughs> Father Theodore here is, um, let's see, what is he? He is um, from the, I had it somewhere here. He is from the seminary, um, the Greek Orthodox Seminary, but I can't remember what it's called. Not St. Vladimir's, that's the Russian one. Huh? Holy Cross, very good. Holy Cross, the Theological Seminary, okay? And he's one of the professors there. He's high up there, and look what he says. The Orthodox Church is the true church of God on earth and maintains, again, the fullness of Christ's truth and continuity with the Church of the Apostles. Not saying that no one else has anything good to offer, but he's saying the fullness is here. And he goes on. This awesome claim does not necessarily mean that the Orthodox Christians have achieved perfection, for we have many personal shortcomings. Nor does it necessarily mean that the other Christian churches do not serve God's purposes positively. For it is not up to us to judge others, but to live and proclaim the fullness of the truth. But, does, but it does mean that if a, personal caref if a person sorry, carefully examines the history of Christianity, he or she will soon discover that the Orthodox Church alone is in complete sacramental, doctrinal, and canonical continuity with the ancient, undivided New Testament church. That's what we're trying to get to right now, is we're trying to discover why this statement is true. I'll, I'll do you a favor right now. If you don't buy what I'm saying, I'll do you a favor. Don't agree with me. Disagree with me, disagree with him, but do me a favor. Come back and find out the rest of the story, okay? And if you really, really want to dig even more, you don't want to wait till next week, go get the book that I said, Becoming Orthodox, or come talk to me. So you don't have to agree with me, because I didn't give you any... I didn't give you facts and things like that. Don't agree with me. But just be open to learning and discovering what the truth is for yourself. And if you come in with an open mind, you're going to... Like, the suitcase is what the suitcase is. So you don't believe me what's inside? I know what's inside it. And what's inside is what's inside it. And hopefully, like I said, through our time here together, we can discover the greatness of what's inside that suitcase. Okay? Let's stand for a prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father. We thank you because you cared so much for us that you didn't leave us alone in this world, but you created the church, and you've given us your body, and you've given us our, our, our beloved mother church to take care of us, to guide us, to teach us, and to kind of keep us in check whenever it is that we get out of line. I really pray, dear Lord, for each and every single soul that's before you, that each one of us would, would be able to have the, the fullness of him who, who fills all in all, that we would discover the fullness of what it is that you've envisioned for us. Maybe some of us is living at like 5% or 10% of your vision for us, but I pray that over the next several weeks we can discover the fullness and we can become active participants inside your body. Thank you, dear Lord, that out of all the people in the whole wide world that you chose me and that you chose each one of us to be here today and to be inside your house. It's something that we're not worthy of, dear Lord, but we thank you and we're eternally grateful for you. Pray, dear Lord, for every single person who's gathered here today, those who are searching for you, that you would enlighten their path and show them the way that leads to life. Pray for our church, for our Father, Bunabshoi, for Tony Rini, all those who ask us to remember them in our prayers through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the intercessions and prayers 
of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, all the apostles and all the disciples, hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated for one minute. A couple quick announcements.